Like now I watch old movies where people are kissing and hugging and sitting really close to each other and breathing in each other's airspace and feel uncomfortable. All right, so I actually know how to do this, but I've never had to do this, but I know many an ER nurse, including my sister who has done this, there was no rule book or playbook is Meredith Grey dressed in a papper. Um, the pandemic has, has uh, profoundly impacted the black community. Let's do this. Hello everyone, welcome back to my channel. My name is Christina, I am a board certified, I'm not sure why I keep clapping. I'm a board certified anesthesiologist, wife, mom, YouTuber for 11 plus years. And today I am, apologies if I uh, sound out of breath, I am nine months pregnant and actually due to deliver next week. So from the time of filming this. So that's exciting. <laughs> All right, so today we are going to be reacting to the first episode of Grey's Anatomy, season 17, episode one, the COVID pandemic episode. So I thought it was really interesting that Grey's Anatomy incorporated rather quickly, um, considering probably some filming constraints due to COVID and production delays and all that kind of stuff that I would imagine happens during a year of a global pandemic when you're supposed to be filming a season of a TV show. But I'm surprised and pl pleasantly surprised that they incorporated COVID into it. And I think that's actually a really wise move because we wouldn't really feel that the reality of the episodes if they didn't, like now I watch old movies where people are kissing and hugging and sitting really close to each other and breathing in each other's airspace and feel uncomfortable. It's sad, <laughs> but that's just the reality of the situation. Of course, these videos would not be made possible without the support of the wonderful sponsors here on this channel. Today's sponsor is a longtime favorite, NordVPN. Been using them for, well, just about a year now, and I absolutely love them. You guys know I always advocate 100% for using a VPN. The only times I don't use a VPN are when I'm here at my home network. But every other time I've got NordVPN loaded on my phone, my iPad, and my computer, pretty much any device I have, and it automatically connects to the VPN whenever I'm not on my home network. Now remember, you can go to nordvpn.com slash Christina Brawley to get a two year plan plus one additional month with a huge discount. We are talking 70% off. You don't wanna miss this deal. 100% worth it. Anytime you're at a cafe, at a restaurant, at an airport, at work, which any public Wi-Fi space or even non-public, so even if you're at work and it's password protected, your employer can still use the Wi-Fi network to be able to spy on what you're, what you're sending out, what messages even you're sending, what activity on the internet you're browsing, even though it's your phone, they can monitor that. And there's usually stipulations and policies associated with connecting to that Wi-Fi network or part of your contract that you don't even realize you're giving them permission to do. So with a VPN, all of that is erased. They cannot see where your traffic is. They cannot see where you're going, where you are, your location, all the things that a person who manages a Wi-Fi network would be able to access. So it's super important that you do this anytime you're not at your own home trusted Wi-Fi network. Make sure if you do anything based on this video, you go and download NordVPN. Go to nordvpn.com slash Christina Brawley, get your two year plan plus an additional month free with a huge 70% discount. It is absolutely essential. And a matter of fact, <laughs> HB was like, Wait, why don't I have NordVPN? I was like, go ahead and sign up. Here's the link. <laughs> this is mine. What I ended up telling HB, the great news, was that you can get actually six devices for each account. So an entire family can set up all of their phones and utilize the service for one membership plan. Put it on your computer, on your tablet, on your phone. Get it, nordvpn.com slash Christina Brawley. Thank you so much, NordVPN, for sponsoring today's video. Now we are going to get into the episode. So, season 17. Episode one. It's anatomy. Okay, Cindy Wright. She fits the profile. Arrest this woman for child trafficking. Please okay. escort Dr. Stop. DeLuca to my what? office. Me? Sorry, honey. We'll reschedule. Why are we rescheduling? 
I have no idea what's going on. <laughs> I know I say that every time. I've heard that when tidal waves hit, there are often people watching on sh There's a lecture we take in residency that's meant to prepare us for such surprises. It's called disaster ethics. Disaster ethics? I didn't get that. future surgeons imagine what they would do when the unimaginable happens. Pepper! But it's perfect. Because while it's good to plan for the worst, you can't really know how you'll handle it. Wow! Okay, so what you're seeing here is Meredith Grey dressed in a papper. That is a powered air purifying respirator. I believe that's what it stands for. I will put it here on the screen if I'm wrong or if I'm right. Um, and what that is, is what we were using very early on in the pandemic, especially when we didn't have a whole lot of data about the efficacy of certain levels of masks and PPE and all that kind of stuff. So um, the last time I remember ever seeing or using one of these was during the Ebola um, outbreak. So that was when I was, when was that? Med, med school or residency? I can't remember. What you wanna do is, we don't typically wear them this way with a simple contact isolation gown or what they're making it look like as a surgical gown. Um, fun fact, let me interrupt myself for a second and say give a huge props and shout out to Grey's Anatomy because they film in a real hospital and they also donated all of their props that like their PPE and their props and any equipment that was needed at the onset of the pandemic because they use real things. Obviously they're using real PPE for the show and they donated all of it to support the healthcare workers of America. I'm not sure exactly where it went in America, but it went to support the frontline workers here in the United States. And I just love that they did that. I think, I think it's amazing. They probably had a hard time getting this PPE just for the show. And you know, I, I just, because they donated every, I, th I think that's really great. I think it's awesome. But anyway, so this papper is basically this shield, this hooded shield that has a seal here. Hers doesn't look like it's sealing that great. Um, and usually it's connected to a white bunny suit that extends all the way down, almost like a painter's suit. So like a Tyvek suit. It's usually like non-breathable, splash resistant. Um, it's not always like this. I think you can still wear it like this. And, and definitely we kind of stopped using Pappers anyway because we found out like the efficacy of N95s and all that kind of stuff was enough. But you don't want your hair exposed. There are spotters that watch you put it on and take it off. And um, so basically you have like a team and you, you need to wear it for the whole time. It's not something you're gonna like take on and t uh, put on and take off and put on and take off every time you go in a patient room. It's something that you're wearing for your shift. And good luck if you need to pee because you're really not supposed to take it off for the whole shift. The reason is because your infection risk or your contamination risk is much higher every time you're putting on and taking off the papper. So they're also very expensive and I don't think you can reuse them. I don't know actually. I don't know 100% about reusing them at least on the same person in a shift. I know there's some ICU nurses that can correct me and let us know in the comments below. So please uh, illuminate us if you've been in the ICU in a COVID unit um, using a papper in the past year. But yeah, so that's what she's wearing. And basically there's a, there's a, um, a tube that connects down from this hood that goes down to the back and has a little uh, powered rest. So the papper is the powered respirator. And so what that means is it is powered, you know, battery pack, and it is constantly churning through air. And so you're not, the nice thing is you're not breathing against, directly against a filter and using the suction of your own lungs to, you know, get breath, which I sound like I could use a pepper right now because I need some assistance. Um, but yeah, so it's just, it's just a powered device that helps filter the air and give you like continuously clean air. Let's continue. Please don't tell me you're experiencing symptoms. I am absolutely not experiencing any symptoms. I'm, I'm here to work. He could barely get up after Richard's surgery. It's the depression that always comes after the mania. You knew this happened, but, but, but you pushed him anyways and you let her. Who's that? 
first stop for every employee, a few questions, and if your temperature is even a hair over 100 degrees, you go back home. No exception. How was the picnic? Turned into a... All right, so you're seeing here, you're seeing here that visitors and employees are lining up to get their temperature screened. Now, this is something I do every day. Every day since March 2020, every single working day. The process has been a little bit more streamlined as we have, you know, realized that it's pretty much here to stay until, you know, we squash this pandemic. But basically what I do is, I, there's, a, there's a few more minutes added to my day. It's okay, it's worth it because it makes you feel safe in the hospital knowing that everyone else around you has been screened and is not febrile. I won't go into the actual evidence based reasoning behind this. I think it just personally, aside from catching anybody with a fever for any reason, which is very nice to do anyway in a hospital, you probably shouldn't have infectious people of any etiology hanging around other sick people or immunocompromised people or other healthcare workers. So it is really nice because normally we get, we catch that in the operating room scene um, because a temperature is a vital sign. So we get anybody with a temperature in pre-op for their first set of vital signs, like we're investigating what's going on, if it's elective surgery, if they don't have a known history of, of an infection, like we're investigating that and we're probably canceling elective surgery, not in a pandemic. But now they get stopped at the door if, if they're febrile and it's not for a known reason like an abscess or something like that. So what does my morning routine typically consist of in the hospital? Usually now we used to have to fill out a questionnaire or answer verbal questions um, coming in and, and talking to the screeners who'd be behind a plexiglass plate. And they use the non-contact thermometers, uh, the temporal region to check your temperature. But basically I get, I now have like a bookmark on my phone that I press and it brings up a screening form with my login information for the hospital, my employee ID, and I tap you no, know, no, 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 or yes, obviously. And since then that questionnaire has been changed a couple of times and even includes a have you received the COVID vaccine in the last 48 hours because you might have a fever for that reason. Um, and I basically state that I have none of these symptoms. I attest to it by hitting submit and it gives me a check mark that is in a different color every single day. I flash that check mark to the screener and they give me a corresponding color sticker to put on my badge. And I, I have accrued over the last almost year now, um, sad to say, um, pancakes of stickers. I just keep putting a new one on top and then I, I decide that it's pancake cleaning day and I like take off the, the short stack of pancakes off of my ID badge, throw it away and start afresh, but yeah. That's what I do every single day. So that's what they're doing here, which is good and accurate. Terrifying statistics on the news and knowing that's not even half the story. Yeah. I tried explaining to my grandma how this is impacting black folks more severely. But all she wants to talk about is how sacrilegious it is to attend church. Okay, so it's really interesting that they're bringing up how this has, um, the pandemic has, has uh, profoundly impacted the black community versus non-black communities. So this is also really, 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 really salient point right now regarding the vaccine. And it's something I would love to spend more time on maybe in a future video, but because of the, the past of, you know, America and the world in general, um, and the scientific community historically testing and, and, and performing research unethically on black people, um, it is very understandable that the black community is actually quite hesitant about getting the vaccine. And so I think that's, it's so great that so many prominent black celebrities, uh, leaders and personalities have all come, stepped out into the public spotlight and received the vaccine on air, like showing people, look, you can trust this, this is safe, I'm doing it. And I think that's really necessary and really needed. I also think that it's impacted the black community and other minority communities in terms of the pandemic so negatively because of either a lack, lack of access to healthcare, a lack of trust in the healthcare system, a lack of, of awareness or education reaching certain, certain communities, um, or poverty. Poverty has a huge role to play in how 
well you can escape this virus because if you live in a small apartment or house or housing unit that houses your entire family in one bedroom, it's gonna be hard to socially isolate. And they also, poorer communities cannot afford to take time off of work. They can't, they don't have the luxury of having a work from home job. So they have to go to work and they have to be exposed and they have to do, they're essential workers. So the, the poorer communities have really been affected negatively and that's not just the black communities but any any community that you know is at or below the poverty line is definitely definitely been hit harder by this pandemic and i love that they touched on that even even briefly i thought we were texting and you said to come over with nothing on i didn't so mean right now cold out actually so i'm just okay. I'm no go. you don't need to leave. no i do i have to okay this is this was good. Kid's face. This was a mistake. But... This happens when I eat nuts, but I didn't eat any nuts. I don't think. Those food labels are small here. Okay, 98.6. So you are going to want to follow the purple line to the ER. I don't want a Chinese doctor. Oh, no. Oh, okay. Then you're going to want to follow this green line to the parking lot, put your roots off back in your car, and hope you don't go into anaphylactic shock. Follow <laughs> the purple line to the ER. Perfect. That's amazing. OMG, Dr. Weber, you look great. Hearts. I love Hello. him. Who is this Next. character? Can we be best friends? Perez. Oh my God. Okay, so that's another, oh my God, they're addressing, it's been like, what, five minutes into this episode and they're addressing so many very salient points that um, were and are still prominent in the in the beginning of this, this pandemic. So um, racism specifically towards Chinese and Chinese Amer Chinese nationals and Chinese Americans. And this extended far beyond just being Chinese. It extended to anybody who looked of Asian descent. And I talked about this early on in one of my coronavirus videos. It was about making sure that we don't let biases and that we, you know, that we don't let uh, uh, fear direct our ethics and morality and doing what is right. And so the xenophobia is very, very common during a pandemic that does not make it right. So I love that they touched on this because it's absolutely inexcusable. And I'm sorry that so many Asian Americans and a, a lot across the world had to endure this type of prejudice, this type of racism during the pandemic when they themselves have, are also scared for their lives. Um, so I love that they touched on that. And I love his response. That's something I would say. Hey. So they're in a Can COVID you please tent. make sure this gets up to the COVID floor with Anna Rivera? Just leave it. Uh, hey, Karen, uh, could I get We had one of these set up during Anderson's my family. at my hospital as well we'll during for you the, the hunt? beginning stages of Hope the kids pandemic. are doing okay. Oh, thanks. Um, my mom's hands are full, but she's managing. Heard a recording of Altman and Karasik having sex? <sighs> or was that the cobalt talking? That was not the cobalt. <laughs> Stop it. Stop it. Stop it. Uh, what about PPE for the staff? We are reusing what we have, but we... Okay, so another very, very commonly touched subject is um, shortage of PPE. They addressed it here. Thankfully, at least in my neck of the woods, that's no longer an issue. Um, places around the world and manufacturing around the world have stepped up very well, maybe not quickly enough, but in a decent amount of time and in a decent amount of months, stamped up, uh, stamped up, ramped up production of PPE. So that's no longer an issue. I no longer have to reuse my N95, but I was using, I was reusing my N95 a lot. Like they were being, there was just talk of what can they do to re-sterilize. We had our names written on our N95s. We'd turn one in and check out our another old one and they would get like, vaporized with, I don't remember what, hydrogen peroxide or something, I can't remember. But it was nasty and the straps of your N95 would stretch over time and that would make the seal less effective, which made us worried that the filtration wasn't gonna be as effective and we didn't trust reused um, N95s. So sometimes, sometimes after five, six, seven, eight, nine uses, which you shouldn't, these are not meant for, for reuse, okay? This is, these N95s are not meant to be reused. 
Um, they're meant to be used once and thrown away. So, but you gotta do what you gotta do in a pandemic, right? Because you want everyone to have an N95. But finally, when you felt like this is dangerous, I, I don't wanna have a false sense of security walking into a room in front of a COVID patient with a faulty N95, some of us would just rip our strap off and be like, oh, it's broken, we need a new one. <laughs> Need more. What? No, 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 no. Well, well, someone's cold in here. And, and we have staff inside to deal with it. Look, hospitals are losing too many of their own, so no one goes through these doors without full PPE, which is in short supply. Yes, it goes against everything we teach, but there are no emergencies in a pandemic. Marvin Okay, no emergencies in a pandemic. I posted this all across social media all the time during the beginning stages as well. You do not have to set yourself on fire to keep someone else warm. What does that mean? Well, we have a very altruistic personality in healthcare. We, we tend to be those who want to sacrifice ourselves to help others, and you can't help. You have to put your own oxygen mask on and before you put on the oxygen mask of someone else, right? So the whole point is, don't kill yourself to, don't put yourself in harm's way because you cannot help people if you are incapacitated, right? You are more valuable healthy than you are sick. So that sounds really depressing, but basically it's true. You do not need to rush in without PPE to, to code a dying COVID patient in order, you know, in order to save their life. And, and that is a very difficult thing to do in real life. It is very, very difficult to see someone coding and not want to rush in and save the day um, because you have to sit there and put on all of this accoutrement that, you know, protects you and is shaving seconds, you know, off of your response time. Yeah, that's, that is, that is a very hard thing to do, but it was definitely something that went, went around in March and April and reminding people because there were definitely healthcare, bra very brave healthcare workers who died because they were, got up into the face and airway of a patient with COVID before we had even testing, I remember. Um, you didn't know who had COVID and who didn't, so you kind of had to treat everyone like they had COVID. But um, I, I remember hearing of one very, very brave nurse um, who died because she administered CPR to a COVID patient and she became incapacitated, overwhelmed by the virus. It was so sad. Lindstrom, 83. He was fine yesterday. Became hypoxic an hour ago. It's the fourth patient I've lost today. And they're all dying alone. Welcome Ooh, back, Richard. Yeah, we, we all got a little bit salty and we still are a little salty. Burnout in healthcare was bad before the pandemic and it is so much worse now. It looks like everyone has a, like a dark brown ponytail that's super long, but it's their pepper. Full thickness burns from head to toe from a car explosion. I intubated him on the scene. He's hypotensive and tachycardic. You ignore the vest you are taking him because if you send us away, he dies and that makes you a murderer. Okay. Okay. From I intubated him with a simple mask on. Girl. Oh. Emergent surgeries only, so it's empty most of the time. Uh, how do I how do I okay, this directly affects me. I had to have direct experience with this for sure. Definitely the canceled surgeries. It was very ironic, interesting, depressing, sad that during the pandemic, when elective cases were canceled, quite rightly so. Why? Because they need to conserve PPE. If they, if, they, if they didn't feel comfortable being in the COVID units, like they were at risk for being laid off. And people like me, I'm not an employee of a hospital. I'm a, an employee of a, an anest a private anesthesia group in my particular instance. So there was no rule book or playbook for how to utilize my services and have the company be reimbursed for my services in order to justify my paycheck. So, Eventually they figured out that you could sign up. They worked out deals with the hospital for us to be able to help. But in a time when, after only a few short months and when that started becoming available, I found out I was pregnant. So I was, there was no way I was going in a COVID unit pregnant, but um, I still had COVID, uh, COVID patients. But once I was pretty pregnant, not, not pretty pregnant, once I found out I was pregnant, wherever we could, we diverted COVID patients away from me and any other pregnant provider. Bailey, what the hell is that? Oh, not that. Her. Her. A room in minutes, hands-free. <laughs> That's incredible. 
Mm, oh, you babies. should be closing the blinds on that. That's not they good for your eyes. On the ball. Welcome back. Yeah. Not too soon. No, in all seriousness, I'm so happy to see you on your feet again. Who is that, House? Oh, well, this way, you won't get any closer than uh, six feet from me. He said was being trafficked. It appears he was... I, uh, I'm so passionate about child trafficking. Oh, I donate um, every year to Love146, a charity I'll link down below. Ha! Ah, I wrapped my phone in plastic, too, until I realized it was totally pointless because I, you can just sanitize Smith. your phone. If you can't deliver the news to her, just find someone who can. Oh, the burnout. The burnout. What do we have? Engible thickness burns. Let's hang some fluids. On These it. kids decided to break quarantine, went out to a party. Party? Now? Face hypotensive. Arms are all charred. This IV's blown. I need access. Okay. IO kit? Right away. Doctor. IO. Okay, here we go. Order trauma panels, get x-ray in here. The sat's still dropping. Okay, what is he doing? All right, so I actually know how to do this, but I've never had to do this, but I know many an ER nurse, including my sister who has done this. This is called an IO line, which is an interosseous line. And I've been trained to do this, but I've never, like I said, I've never had to do, I like to think because I can get an IV on any everyone. You excuse me while my big head explodes, but an intraosseous line is like in a situation like this. You cannot find a vein. You cannot find a vein anywhere. Everything is too obscured. I mean, personally, I, would, I mean, I put it in a central line, but if he's crashing, you may not even have time to do that. An intraosseous, typically the best place for an intraosseous is right on the flat side of the ch of the shin here. Oh, it said chin. Not on your chin. On your shin and it's basically a, like almost like a screwdriver and what you can do is administer fluids into the bone because the bone is very vascular and you can uptake fluids and get someone hydrated it's very temporary it's not something that will last very long you still need to obtain some sort of intravenous access whether that's a central line or some large bore ivs but it at least can you can give them pressors blood products, fluids, all that good stuff. It goes into the channels of the bone and then gets distributed out to the rest of the body, um, assuming that that is not disrupted by fractures and all that kind of stuff. Um, so it is temporary measure and um, basically you take, it's a kit and you take, sterilely prep the area, they just splash some betadine on there and then that wasn't blood, that was betadine. And you just go find that flat surface right below the kneecap um, on the shin and you just and you just you feel it kind of engage and then you can hook up a cap and hook fluids up to it and it's easy peasy it's very simple you shouldn't use it for very long but it it gets you it gets you it buys you time it buys you time you know i gotta tell you that this place couldn't ask for a better chief i'm in awe. oh there's the n95s you being reused and sterilized Oh, you should never hey. touch gloves, touch a door handle with your gloves hey. like that. How's he doing? Never, 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 never. Put on well, a new set stable. on the inside. I think his visit from his mom Because they're considered contaminated. Hi, uh, Mr. Morris. Yes. Hey, your son Frankie was taken to Seattle Presbyterian because we're a COVID center. Oh, my God. No, they are understaffed, so they turned away his ambulance. Are you kidding I've me? been in touch with my husband, who's a first responder. They're bringing him back here. He is stable, right? He should be here momentarily. Oh, my God. Okay, thank okay. you. All right, how you deliver bad news to parents and family members is... You tell them what the situation is, you tell them the straightforward truth, you do not beat around the bush, and you say, here's what we're doing to fix it, or here's here's what's happening now, or here's how we're going to, to make that right, or here's the resolution. So you wanna bring them through a story of, here's what happened, here's what we did about it, here's what's gonna happen next. Hey, Mr. Bronson said his wife was here, but I can't find her. Can you just let her know that his ORIF went right. fine? Okay, ORIF. I don't know this this person or if they're a couple or what. I don't know the like plot line, but ORIF I can talk about. Open reduction internal fixation is an orthopedic procedure. Typically, it's just a very vague generalized phrase for any time that you're going to have a surgical correction of a fracture. So if there's some sort of fracture somewhere, something that needs to be fixated, that's the F. Um, then it's open, which means they're gonna go in and have a surgery to fix it, not closed. Closed means they're manipulating it from the outside, like reducing a fracture. 
So a closed reduction would be like in the ER setting and they are, you know, pulling traction and getting the bones realigned and kind of like your classic fixing of, of a leg break type of situation. But any situation where my husband can talk more about this, this the criteria is that you need to go in surgically to fix it. It will not heal properly or it's not safe to do it when it's um, to keep it closed. Um, then it's open. So they're going to sterilely prep. They're going to open. Um, around the, the fracture, they're going to reduce the fracture, looking at the bones, and then they're going to fixate it. So they're going to either put plates, pins, screws, um, cables, wires, an ex external fixator, which is a big cage-like thing that wraps around um, an, an extremity, um, any of those things. Um, actually, X-Fix is separate than an ORIF. Typically, you'll use an X-Fix when you have a lot of swelling and you're not it's not advisable to like permanently fix the bone yet. You need to like reduce it, keep it in place, let the skin, all the tissues uh, decrease their swelling a little bit first, and then you can go back in for a st second stage operation and do an ORIF. So I would take care of patients all the time that have um, an X-Fix. So we'd put the X-Fix on and then I'd get to see them again sometimes by chance for their second stage surgery, which would be they'd come in with their X-Fix on and they'd get the X-Fix removed and get an ORIF. So that's what that means. They shouldn't have even been out there, but they felt sorry for Frankie. Wait a minute, you think that this is Frankie's fault? Posting all the time about how sad he is he can't be with his friends. He missed a year of school. This moron! Disaster has a tendency to melt away everything else in life. Selfish son <laughs> So if you want to know who you'll be in a disaster, ask yourself. Oh, come in. Hi. How was your day, princess? I'm filming. How much? How much? Hi. Hi. <laughs> Look at the screen. Look at the mirror right there. Look at the mirror right there. Say hi, everybody. Hi, everybody. <laughs> Oh, my AirPods? Okay, you can have my AirPods. You leave a ton of AirPods. But don't take them out and don't lose them, okay? Okay. Not like you lost Papa's AirPods, okay? Don't lose them. Promise? Okay. Okay. How was your day at school? Are you going to make pizza at home? Did you bring some home? Yeah. Good. It's for you. Baby. Oh, thank you, baby. All right. Uh, but it's for Papa, too. Okay, we can share with Papa. And we can share with Harper. Yes. Bye-bye. <laughs> Love you, hum honey buns. Thank you, everyone, for watching today's video. Please give this video a like if you enjoyed it. Make sure you leave a comment down below responding to any of the questions that I asked in today's video. Huge shout out again to my sponsor, NordVPN, for sponsoring today's video. And leave a request for any other episodes of any other shows you'd like me to react to. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you in the next one. Bye!